big trigger warning for this video. We are going to be discussing repatriation, topics of racism, and a, f a few other things. So if you are ready, we're going to get into this. So I wanted to talk about this article that I came across and just share it with you guys, but also just discuss a few layered things. And before I get into that, I want to explain a little bit of context in terms of who I am for those who don't know. I am Tlingit indigenous from Southeast Alaska. That makes me Alaska native. My dad's family is all from Sitka and that area. My grandmother is a survivor of boarding schools and my dad works in repatriation for our tribe, which is the return of artifacts or remains to their home communities. So something that I have been paying attention to and sometimes sharing with you guys over on my newsletter is the uptick in museums repatriating indigenous remains and artifacts to their tribes. So the Department of Interior made some updates to NAGPRA, which is the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. That was implemented in 1990. It was designed to compel institutions that received federal funding, so colleges or museums, to repatriate their collections. Now, the rabbit hole that I've been down for a little bit is how these collections came to be in these museums. And this article that I came across last night talks about it. Racism, morbid curiosity drove US museums to collect indigenous remains. We are going to read through portions of this article. If you would like to read the whole thing, it's gonna be linked below. In December, 1900, John Wesley Powell received, quote, the most unusual Christmas present of any person in the United States, if not the world. The gift for this first director of the Smithsonian Institution's Bureau of Ethnology was a sealskin sack containing the mummified remains of an Alaska native. The sender was a government employee hired to hunt Indian relics, who said the remains had been difficult to acquire because, quote, to come into possession of a dead Indian is a great crime among the Indians, end quote. And the report concluded that it was the only Indian relic of its kind at the Smithsonian, and it was beyond money value. As it turned out, it was not the museum's only Alaskan mummy. In 1865, before the U.S. purchased Alaska from Russia, William H. Dahl was hired to accompany an expedition to study the potential for a telegraph route through Siberia to Europe. In his spare time, he looted graves in the Yukon in caves on several Aleutian islands. After the U.S. sealed the deal with Russia, the San Francisco-based Alaska Commercial Company won exclusive trading rights and established more than 90 trading posts in Alaska to meet the U.S. demand for ivory and furs. It also instructed agents to collect and preserve objects of interest in ethnology and natural history and forward them to the Smithsonian. Ernest Hennig looted 12 preserved bodies and a skull from a cave in the Aleutians in 1874. He donated two to the California Academy of Science and sent the remainder to the Smithsonian. More than 30 years after the passage of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act meant to return these re those remains, a ProPublica investigation last year estimated that more than 110,000 Native American, Native Hawaiian, and Alaska Native ancestors remain in public collections across the U.S. It is not known how many indigenous remains are closeted in private or overseas collections. Quote, museums collected massive numbers, perhaps even millions, said anthropologist John Stephen Chip Cowell who previously served as curator of anthropology at Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Out of, the hun out of the 100 remains we at the Denver Museum returned, I think only about five or seven individuals were actually even studied. So the article does continue about the history of museums collecting indigenous remains. This is where I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent. The part where they said it is not known how many indigenous remains are closeted in private or overseas collections. It reminded me of an article from 2019 published in the Smithsonian Magazine, no less. 
The FBI is trying to return thousands of stolen artifacts, including Native American burial remains. Five years after the FBI's six-day raid on a rural Indiana home. Additional trigger warnings before I read portions of this article to you guys. Five years ago, FBI agents descended on a house in rural Indiana packed with ancient artifacts unlawfully obtained by the home's owner, 91-year-old Don Miller. Over a six-day raid, the agency seized more than 7,000 objects in a collection that ranged in the tens of thousands. It remained the largest single recovery of cultural property in the agency's history. Witnessing the sheer number of artifacts accumulated was jaw-dropping. FBI agent Tim Carpenter later recall recollected in an interview, most staggering of all was the discovery that Miller had amassed approximately 500 sets of human remains, many of which are believed to have been looted from Native American burial grounds. It was no secret that the homeowner possessed a collection of artifacts that, according to the FBI, ultimately swelled to 42,000 in number. Miller, who died in 2015, was a Christian missionary who was known among his community for his collections of treasure that he accumulated during vacation time traveling around the world on archaeological digs. To that end, he often invited local residents reporters, and Boy Scout troops to his home to view his artifacts. However, he kept the human remains largely out of sight. The FBI says Miller's collecting had crossed the line into illegality and outright looting. That became particularly clear when agents found the human bones among his artifacts. According to the CBC, it is not clear if Miller obtained bones of his, on his own or if he purchased them on the black market. Buying and selling Native American remains is illegal in the United States, thanks to the 1990 legislation that sought to correct the once common practice of looting cultural artifacts from indigenous graves for trade among museums and collectors. That article was originally published in 2019, and since then, the repatriation work has been slow, but they are consulting with tribes and trying to speed up the process. The article that I first talked about in this video cited ProPublica's investigation on the museums that are currently still holding Native American remains today. That was a series that I have been following closely and have talked about frequently in my newsletter as well. And for those who do not know, the remains of thousands of Native Americans were returned to tribes this year, more than any year since the implementation of NAGPRA. And this is thanks to the tireless advocacy of tribes all over the United States, as well as the work of journalists who continue to hold these institutions accountable. And it is very important work to put names to these stories, to these people, have gone through so much and have not been allowed peace or dignity even in death. My father, Bob Sam, has done a lot of work to identify and repatriate these lost people, and I am continuing the work in my own small way by sharing these stories with you here. And for everyone who would like to continue your journey on understanding the world of repatriation, I have resources linked on my website below and more videos that you can watch. All right, I'm going to leave this here and go make myself another cup of coffee. I will see you guys next time. Bye.